you were made to count to have an impact today on this world for God and for good. And we're learning about that together. I was thinking about how often you can go online and sign up for a master class. Look at somebody who has mastered a particular craft or an art or literature and actually learn by sitting at their feet. And I was thinking it'd be great for us to learn about how to make our lives count, how to have an impact in our world for God by sitting at the feet of some of the masters who have done that across the ages. So that's what we're going to do for the next period of time. We'll see how long this goes. We're going to start with a man named Ignatius of Loyola. And I read some time ago a book by Chris Lowney, who was a uh, Jesuit. Uh, Ignatius formed a, an order, a community of people over time, uh, who were committed to a common mission and a common way of life. And uh, very often when those kind of orders got started, they were named after their founders. So the Dominicans after Dominic, the Franciscans after Francis. And that started to happen with the people that followed Ignatius, but he would not have it, did not want a cult of personality. So they called themselves the Company of Jesus, the Companions of Jesus, the Society of Jesus, or Jesuits, if you've heard of that. Now, Lowney has an interesting story. This is a book about how to impact your world based on the wisdom of Ignatius. It's called Heroic Leadership. But he says at the beginning of it, after living for seven years as a Jesuit seminarian, practicing vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience to the Jesuit gentle in Rome, I morphed into a corporate man. On Friday afternoon, my role model was the Jesuit founder, St. Ignatius Loyola, whose writings reminded us seminarians that poverty as the strong wall of the religious life should be loved. The following Monday brought a new career in investment banking and new role models. One managing director lured talented would-be recruits with the tantalizing prospect of becoming hog whimperingly rich. I never quite got this image. What does it take to make a hog whimper? And is that a good thing? But I got the point. At first I kept a low profile. My head was often spinning and even casual conversation left me acutely aware that my background was, to say the least, a bit different than that of my new colleagues. When fellow new hires regaled colleagues with tales of amorous scores that summer, what was I going to talk about? Making my final week-long silent retreat? Or purchasing my first non-black suit? So he lives, as all of us do, in two different worlds, and what the Bible often speaks of as the visible world, the things that we can see, money, possessions, our body's health, and then the invisible world of love and joy and peace and the presence of the Spirit of God. And we must learn if we're going to impact the visible world to actually pay attention to the invisible world. He has a fascinating observation by a Harvard Business School Professor Emeritus, Abraham Zelesnik, that leaders are twice born individuals who endure major events, traumas, difficulty, setbacks, that lead to a sense of separateness or perhaps estrangement from their environments. As a result, they turn inward in order to reemerge with a created rather than an inherited sense of identity. And that notion of being separated, we've talked about a fair bit. It goes way back to Genesis that God separates in order to triumph over chaos, light from darkness, and the earth from the sky, and the dry land from the waters, and then joins together. And that this is true when it comes to persons. And I thought it was very interesting that what is apparently a secular writer on people of impact or leadership says that when people truly have impact, very often they have had to go through something, some difficulty that has caused a sense of separateness. But then through that, um, they are given a creative sense of mission, of freedom from having to do what everybody else thinks they should do, being able to make contributions that they feel deeply called to do. So I would invite you to think for a moment, how is it, uh, where's an area where you've gone through a setback or a challenge or a difficulty, and how might God have spoken, be speaking to you or to me through that? Now, for Ignatius, it worked like this. Ignatius was born into a family of minor nobility, and he was relatively affluent, and so he became a soldier and had dreams of a successful light in the court, glamorous military victories and uh, 
romantic experiences with women, but he ran into a trouble. When he was able to lead a troop, he was trying to defend uh, a fortress and they were overwhelmed. So he was a humiliating loser. And then worse, a cannonball injured his leg and he was vain enough. It did not look good in the very tight fitting leggings of that day. So he tried to have it reset by a surgeon and it ended up looking worse. It was basically uh, 16th century cosmetic surgery. And he did not any longer cut the kind of figure who would be effective romantically. And so he began to think about what should he do next? And his next idea was that he would devote himself to God only here's a real important thing. Very often when we think about journeys of faith, we think about before and after stories where there's a crisis, and he certainly had one of those, a big setback. And then the after is just one experience of uh, clarity and spiritual victory after another. It was not that way for Ignatius at all. His next decision was that he would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and live a life of self-imposed deprivations and suffering like the great saints did. And his family begged him not to do that, but he did. It took him 18 months to get to Jerusalem. He let his hair grow. He used to be so vain that he would have cosmetic surgery on his legs. Now he went to the other extreme, let his fingernails grow like Howard Hughes and the corkscrews, made such a nuisance of himself. It took him 18 months to get to Jerusalem. And after three weeks, they deported him. So, he lost that career. Next, he decided he needed to do some remedial education work. So he began to go back and study Latin with teenage, pre-teenage boys. There was an Adam Sandler movie called Billy Madison, where Adam Sandler plays this character that neglects his education, has to go back with a bunch of little kids in a humiliating way. So if Ignatius is going to be portrayed in a movie, it'll be Adam Sandler. And in the midst of all this, by this time, he's like 40 years old. He's lived two thirds of his life. Basically, the printing or expected lifespan back in that day and has zero accomplishments. But he goes to a place called Manresa, a little town in Spain, expected to only be there for a few days. And he encounters God there. And what happens transforms his life. And he comes to a very deep understanding that God exists and that God is calling him to do something with his life. Now, again, he doesn't have any clarity yet on exactly what that should be. Uh, however, Lonnie puts it like this. Uh, Though his personal pilgrimage continued, his self-punishment stopped. And I was thinking, if you have gone through a difficult time, it's an important distinction to make between I'm on pilgrimage, but I'm not going to be doing self-punishment. I will often talk these days to parents where they're in some pain in their family because we share that. And uh, sometimes there will be people who live in denial. Everything's going to be fine. My kid doesn't really have a problem and they have not yet begun their pilgrimage. Sometimes people live in self-punishment. It's all my fault. I must just chastise myself over and over and live in self-blame and misery. And for them, the pilgrimage has not yet begun either. Though his pilgrimage continued, his self-punishment did not. He decided he'd, he could cut his hair and didn't let, let his fingernails grow super long. He pulls a little group of people together with him. And as their mutual friendship developed, they banded together in a loose association to help souls. To help souls? What does that mean? What were their occupations? What were their products? They couldn't have answered those questions with much precision, and it shows in their early endeavors. They have these grandiose ideas that they're going to travel around the world, but because of restrictions due to a, a bunch of reasons, they were actually uh, forced to remain in Italy, which is a real good thing, although they had no idea at the time. And they look like they were feeling pretty badly. Even Ignatius. Colleagues remember him in Italian town squares trying to preach in some nearly unintelligible pigeon of Spanish, Latin, and Italian, ridiculed by children who pelted the balding, limping Bosque with apples. And yet, as they continued to stumble their way forward, they would have an impact on the world that was remarkable. They began to sense a calling to education. In 10 years, they had founded 30 colleges. By 1800 or so, there were 700 secondary schools and universities that were followed, founded by the Jesuits. Something like 20% of all Europeans that received the classical education were receiving it from them. 
And we'll look at how it is that God moved in the life of Ignatius and his followers. But it kind of struck me. They were a community that's called an order. They were trying to find God together, pursuing a common way of life. I, th I think that's kind of what we are in the fellowship of the withered hand. And I would ask you today, reflect on where's their pain in your life and how will you steward it? One of the most important verses for me over these last few years has been Genesis chapter 50, verse 19, where Joseph, who also knew challenge and setback and heartbreak, said to his brothers, uh, don't live in despair. Don't punish yourselves any longer. What you intended for harm, God used for good. I give a good friend where we had a conversation the other night, very gifted person, but his pain has maybe even ex exceeded his gifts. And the question uh, that we talked about is, how will we steward our pain? Where is God meeting you in the midst of that difficulty, that setback, precisely like he did with Ignatius and that cannonball and that injury, and then long periods of years where he felt frustrated, and yet ultimately God was leading him through that to find a little community that would seek to help souls and to be able to do that in a way that had a deep impact on the world. That's what we're all called to. Very often it starts not with a grandiose call to what I'm gonna do, but by disappointment with what I thought I was gonna do that I could not. Find God there. Ask God to meet you there. Ask God, how can I steward this pain in the lives of other people? Make today count. Thanks for joining us here at becomenew.me. If you'd like to receive the daily emails that go along with each video, let us know at becomenew.me at gmail.com. Or if you want prayer, you can text us at 855-888-0444.